Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm chapter 89. If you haven't been here because you were plagued with that plague going around town for the last couple weeks, we have been in a series in the book of Psalms called Honest Questions in the Psalms. And we've been asking tough questions of what are you doing, O Lord, when we face pain, when we face hurt, when we face rejection and abandonment. And today we are zeroing in on the steadfast love of the Lord, or more broadly, his promises, and why they seem so far when we suffer. So as you're turning there, I have a question for you. How many times have you prayed, Lord, show me your will? My guess is if you're anything like me, you've prayed that prayer many, many times. Because who wouldn't want to know the Lord's will? Who wouldn't want to know what God is wanting us to do without a shadow of a doubt? Discerning the plans of God is understandably something that every believer would desire to know. Who wouldn't want to know God's plan so they could follow and be on the path of his blessing and approval? The problem is, there's a tension here when we pray to know the will of God. Knowing and living the will of God can be very challenging at times. Challenging in the sense that there are moments in our lives when we wonder, what in the world, God, are you doing? There are situations, there are circumstances and events that are confusing and conflicting, and they cause us to wrestle. And they might leave us wondering, how does this all fit in to God's plan? I don't understand it, Lord. I know you do, but I don't. Have you ever been there? It's okay to answer. I only bite a little. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I think we all have been there. I know I have been there many, many times in my life. These moments that we find ourselves in that are not very clear and they leave us wondering what our God doing are the moments, if you remember back to last week's sermon, that I have called the dark side of God's will. And remember, don't interpret dark side as the bad side of God's will. Just like the, the earth spins and we go into the shadow of the moon, right? And it becomes nighttime and it comes cold and uh, sometimes depressing until Christmas comes because there's nice and lights, but I'll wait off till Advent. Um, but uh, it's just like that, being on the night side of God's will. Being on the dark side of God's will doesn't change anything about God's providential care or love. These are moments that we are in the orbit of God's will, but the moment that, uh, that you're in a place which the warm glow of his promise-keeping grace is eclipsed by difficulty, confusion, and pain. And we're in those moments at time times and you know that God is still in control you know that God's promises are still real but the problem is is in the eclipse of this moment it leaves you feeling dark it leaves you feeling cold and lonely and you know that one day the sun will shine again but when you're in the dark side of God's will moments the promises seem like they are a far way off and you might be in that kind of position today Or maybe you've been in that kind of position, or you haven't, but you're going to be at some point in your life. And when you find yourself in this type of season, church, you need a psalm like Psalm 89. Because Psalm 89 is a psalm for those dark side moments. It's a psalm written to help us understand the dichotomy between God's promise and the reality of present pain. This is the longest psalm that we have looked at in our mini-series. And I only mention that because what we see in all 52 verses of of the psalm is the psalmist wrestling for a long time with the dynamics of the dark side of God's will. And that should bring you some comfort because it shows us that there's no quick fixes to life. There's no quick fixes in grief. And I want you to feel that burden lifting off of you. If you've been working through hard questions in life, if you've been going through trialing circumstances, and if you've been dealing with the pain of loss and confusion, I know you at times, because I've been there and I've felt this, you feel the pressure that you need to get over it quickly so that people either think you're a healthy Christian or that because you think they're annoyed with you. I remember when I was grieving the death of my father, it was like six months out, and someone asked, what's wrong? And I'm like, well, I'm just missing my dad. And I felt like he was annoyed with me because I was still struggling in my pain. 
But grief is not tame, church. Write that down. Grief is not tame. And at times it takes a while to heal. And that's okay. That's okay. And we see that in Psalm 89 with psalmists wrestling with what's going on and trying to come to terms with how this all fits together in God's plan. And he spends 52 verses doing so. So don't believe the lie that there are any quick fixes and easy answers because there's not. This, and you'll never get this from me, this is not a self-help talk, a TED talk, where I'm glad you guys are all here to listen to something good, and and it's not going to give any benefit to you. I'm not going to give you four steps at the end of the sermon, and after those four steps, your life's going to magically get better. That's not how it works. If you're here today, and you're in one of those dark side moments, my goal is to encourage you, yes, with the Word of God, to give you tools that you can use to heal, but hear this. The reality is, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to give you tools, but at the end of this sermon, at the conclusion of this service, when you walk back out through those doors, your life's not going to change automatically. There's still going to be a lot of work. You've got to use the tools. I have some really nice tools in my garage, but I'm the worst handyman. They just collect dust half the time, okay? I thought by buying expensive tools, they would just make me handy. That's, I guess that's not how it works. But, um, and it's the same with biblical tools, You can have them all in your head and know about them, but if you don't use them and get experienced in them, then they're just collecting dust, just like my wrenches. But as we see in the psalmist, he wrestles for 52 verses, and this is helpful because it shows us that the dark side moments are just a part of life. This psalm is like a friend who's been there. They've done that. And here's what you should do from my experience. It's helpful when we know that somebody understands our pain. But even more, this psalm gives us a way forward. It gives us a way to think when God's will is confusing and dim at times in our life. So I want to unpack this psalm and I want to give us all guidance for what we do when we're in the hard and confusing times of our life, when, when we find ourselves on the dark side of God's will. And first, what I want you to notice in verses 1 to 4 is that the psalmist is going to start with intentional praise. Now, before we actually get into verse 1, your Bible probably has a little bit of an introduction before that psalm, and these are called superscripts. And We can debate about this, but a lot of scholars actually believe these are inspired, and I fall there as well. I think these are part of Scripture. They're superscripts, and they're very important. And mine reads, it's a maskal of Ethan the the Ezraite. And I did a little worship, or not worship, whoa, that's weird. I did a little research on this guy named Ethan, and apparently he was a really, really wise man. He lived during the time of David and Solomon between those two rules. According to 1 Kings 4.31, Ethan was renowned for his wisdom because Solomon's actually even described as being wiser than Ethan. So Solomon being the wisest guy around, saying he's even wiser than Ethan, shows you that Ethan was a pretty wise dude. And psalms like the psalm story like these were designed to be teaching tools. In fact, that is what a maskal means. It's a song that teaches. Therefore, this psalm is a song that is designed to communicate a particular message to us. It's designed to be didactic in its purpose. And it's not just meant to be melodious or soothing to our ears. Ethan wrote this psalm for the intent of teaching us something. And now this creates a bit of a problem. And I wrestled if I wanted to talk about this. But if you went home and you just typed in this psalm into Google, the first thing you're going to see is that there's a little bit of conflict around this psalm. Because Ethan, as I said, lived during the unified monarch period between David and Solomon. And, uh, and what you'll see later is this psalm, beginning in verse 38, laments the destruction of the Davidic dynasty. But e- it would be impossible for Ethan to be alive when that happened. So what do we do with this seeming tension? Well, there's two solutions. And I'll give you the one that I believe, and you can wrestle with it. And the two solutions are the original psalm is from verses 1 to 37, and then additional verses were added by inspired people psalmist by the Lord at a different period of time by God and this is where I land because they're lamenting the destruction of the Davidic dynasty and this whole psalm from 1 to 32 is praising the promises of the Davidic covenant so what they're doing is they're in exile I'll get to why I believe that in a minute but they're in exile in Babylon and they're going remember the good old days and by remembering the good old days 
they get inspired by the Holy Spirit to continue this song. And we're going to wrestle with that tension. The other option is, is that there is this common practice in Israel's history of choirs forming around great people. And those choirs would begin to write on behalf of those people. And then those choirs would just be replaced over the years by new scholarly inspired people. And that could have happened as well. This could have been Ethan's choir that's been writing for hundreds of years at this point. But that one's a little more up in the air for me. I think it's more of a reflection and inspiration type moment. But regardless, that doesn't matter. This psalm is inspired by God. And its intent is to teach people how to think and how to live in the midst of challenging circumstances. So the psalmist begins with a very specific and intentional upward focus. And this praise in our first four verses is not just about God in general. He's not just using generalities. It centers on the theme of the Davidic covenant. So when you hear these verses, verses 1 to 4, listen for phrases like steadfast love. If you're using a different translation, it might be faithful love, things like that. Uh, And the theme of covenant, or even the word covenant. So if you have your Bibles, let's pick up reading in verses 1 to 4. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. So clearly, in these first four verses, it's something to do with David. David, after all, was renowned in biblical history. He was called by God, a man after God's own heart. And he's really the figurehead of the glory days of Israel. Even though Solomon, his son, would go on to have more wealth and power and maybe even prestige than his father, David was the one who brought the nation together and united them in heart and soul. While Abraham is viewed as the father of the Jewish people, David is commonly viewed as the father of the nation of Israel. And additionally, David had a special relationship with God, and God made a covenant with him. You see, David desired to build God a temple. He wanted to build God the permanent dwelling place so the glory, the Shekinah glory, could rest in the temple, and they could go to one spot to worship. But as he was making those plans, a prophet says, no, 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 this is not what God wants you to do. Your son's going to do that. But you're not going to do that. And instead, God does something greater, in my opinion. He makes a covenant with David, and this is found in 2 Samuel 7, to 12, uh, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 16. And it says, When your days are filled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, uh, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love shall not depart from him, as I took from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. What a promise. What a covenant. And that's the covenant that's behind the psalm we're reading today, Psalm 89. That's what we're going through. So that's why we see Ethan using language like steadfast love and covenant and the repetition of covenant. Because the promises essentially is that Israel will one day be ruled by a descendant of David whose reign will be established forever. And embedded in this covenant is important words like build and establish and steadfast love as you keep hearing. Words which we are clear, uh, which are were very clear in the first four verses of Psalm 89. And the parallels are intentional between Psalm 89 and 2 Samuel 7. The psalmist here is intentionally recounting the promises of God. He is rehearsing the beautiful things about what God has promised. And I just want you to note that. Because that's so powerful for us to do in our lives, to remember and recount the promises of God. 
And then secondly, we move into exalting in who God is. We see that in verses 5 to 18. The focus of the psalmist shifts beyond the dynamic of intentional praise. The psalm now shifts to a very intense focus on who God is. He moves from general praise to very specific statements of adoration, which highlight different aspects of God's greatness, including his majesty, his might, and his morality. So as we read, we're going to pull all of those out, starting in verse 5. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and the awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. So he begins with a focus on God's majesty, uh, the greatness and in, in, in other, in, is otherworldly. God deserves praise in the heavens in verse 5, from the angels who are called the holy ones also in verse 5, from the skies as we see in verse 6, and the heavenly beings because he is awesome above all who are around him in verse 7. No one is greater than God and no one is more faithful than he, verse 8. In other words, he is just extolling and exalting God's majesty. And then in verses 8 to 13, he turns to exaltation of God's might. He says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule reign, uh, 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 You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves rise, you still them. You, cra- you crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth is also yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, Hermon which are uh, mountains, are joyous praising your name you have a mighty arm strong in your hand high in your right hand God's might has been seen in history and then he talks about the sea which is the most formidable and unpredictable part of man's environment it scared men it still scares me too and it's something that only God can rule it's only God can still only God can tame the sea great nations are nothing before him in verse 10 Rahab which is a nickname for Egypt is crushed like a carcass before the Lord God owns all of creation verse 11 and it praises him as we see in verse 12 and God is mighty in verse 13 and then the psalmist goes on to talk about his morality in 14 to 18 He says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the uh, the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt in your name above all the day, and in righteousness are exalted. For uh, For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For your shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. So what we see is righteousness, justice, and steadfast love are the foundation of God's reign. Blessing comes to those who are under God's reign. And those who are under God's reign benefit from righteousness. The moral perfection of God, specifically His holiness, is an empowering and protective cover for God's people. And the psalmist is reminding his own heart about the beauty of who God is between those chunks of scripture. He is recounting the character of God and he's anchoring his soul to the reality of what God is like. And he thinks back on history. He knows it to be true of God. He reflects on these beautiful truths of who he is. And by doing this, he is pointing his heart upwards towards God because he's in, as we'll see, a very dark spot. And this is one of the major reasons that we love the Psalms so much. Because they stoke the fires of our hearts through God-centered adoration, through God-centered worship. They help take our focus off our circumstances and place them on God, who eclipses our circumstances. So if you find yourself emotionally down, and struggling to understand what's going on in life, you are going to find great 
comfort in the Psalms because they bring us back to who God is and what God is like. The psalmists, they lift us beyond our circumstances and our limited view of life. They help us behold the beauty of God in the midst of our trials. And that is what's happening here in Psalm 89. So there is not just a clear sense of intentional praise and exalting of, in who God is, but now there is a sense of rehearsing the promises of God found in verses 19 to 37. He highlights this in the beginning in verses 1 to 4. He talked about the greatness of God in 5 to 18. And now from 19 to 37, he's going to zero in specifically on the promises of God as it relates to the Davidic covenant. And I mean, it's just amazing. Because the covenant with David was hinted at in the first few verses, and now it's brought out front and center. The psalmist from multiple angles is going to identify the beautiful promises that God has given David and to his people through David. And the Davidic covenant is a really important aspect of Israel's identity. And in a moment, you'll understand why it's so remarkable that he's talking about it this way. And for the sake of time, and because really... The passage needs no explanation. I just want to read it for you from 19 to 37. So if you have your Bibles, just follow along with me. Starting in verse 19, which said, oh, there's no, there's going to be, it's not going to be on the screen. So uh, 19 says, of old you spoke, uh, you spoke in a vision to your godly ones and said, I have granted help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with the holy oil I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn and the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever. And my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever in his thrones as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake uh, my law and do not work, walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the world, uh, the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. A faithful witness in the skies. Selah. Imagine God saying that about you. What a powerful promise. And if you're reading that psalm and you're in David's kingdom, you can't help go celebrate good time, right? Because it's, ex it's exciting. David is going to be forever. His kingdom's going to establish forever. God is for us. He's going to go before us. He's going to fight our battles. He's not going to leave us high or dry. He's not going to turn his back on us. Go, God. Go, God. Go. They're excited. This is an amazing promise. It's a message that is sure and hopeful. It's trying triumphant. It's about the character of God and his promises, and they're rejoicing in that. And if you stop there in 37, where I think the, the, the psalmist originally ended it, it would be a very hopeful and wonderful and encouraging psalm. But just like our life, we have these mountaintop experiences, and then we come to 38 and it's like a downhill valley experience. It doesn't stop there. In fact, right at the top of the mountaintop experience, the psalmist takes a hard left turn. It's like you can almost hear the car. It's on two wheels going around the bend. And, and you're like, whoa, what's happened? It almost gives you whiplash at how quick it comes. When, where the psalmist says in verse 38, he's talking about the covenant being eclipsed. And he says, but now you have cast off and you have rejected, and you are full of wrath. What? 
We were just praising your name, and you have cast off. You have rejected, and now you are full of wrath. And you just got to see the dynamic here. After talking about uh, uh, the intentionally praising God, extolling his majesty and might and power, and rehearsing the promises of David's covenant, and then out of nowhere, in verse 38, he says, Oh, now, O Lord, you have rejected. Now you are full of wrath. And what comes in verse 38 to 45 is a section filled with incredible amount of pain, confusion, and devastation. And we're not entirely sure why, where this psalm fits in biblical history, but like I said, I think it's likely reflecting from my study, and most scholars agree with this, is a time when Israel was taken captive to Babylon. The king at the time would have been Zedekiah. He was in the line of David. He was the third son of the great reforming king Josiah, who rediscovered the law and reformed Israel and brought their worship back to God. And then what happened is when, he, when Zedekiah comes in the rule, the Babylonians lay siege to Jerusalem for 18 months. And this was a typical military attack of the day. You circle the city, you cut off all their resources, including food and water, and you just wait until they surrender. Because why would you fight when they're just going to either die in the walls or they'll just surrender to you? But Israel, being Israel, didn't surrender. And you can just imagine, it's actually detailed in the Bible in spots, the unspeakable atrocities, the horrors that were happening inside of the city walls for, because there was no resources for 18 months. And eventually, Babylon would attack Jerusalem, and it was conquered, and it was plundered. They murdered the children of Zedekiah in front of him and then plucked his eyes out. So the last thing he would see was his children being murdered unspeakable, disgusting. They murdered his kids and plucked his eyes out and then carried him away in chains to Babylon where he remained a prisoner until they eventually put him to death. Eventually, the Babylonians would return to Jerusalem and absolutely destroy it. And all there was left was a few peasants in some fields, according to Jeremiah 52, 16. So if we got this right, their king is a blind captive their great city is plundered and decimated. The temple is completely demolished. This is the dark side of God's will. The promises of God they, that sounded so precious and personal back in verses 1 to 37 now seem like they're an eternity away. <clears throat> and verses 38 to 45 are filled with enormous amounts of pain. And I want you to notice how many times the word you is in these next verses. It appears 13 times where the psalmist is reflecting not only on the reality of the challenge in front of them, but the fact that God is directly involved in a part of the issue. God, you made all of these promises. Look at what has happened. Look at the situation that we're now in, God. Where are those promises that you promised to David? Our king is gone. Our city is gone. Our temple is gone. We're no longer in our homeland, O oh Father. Where are you, O oh Lord? And he's deeply wrestling with this, and he knows what to, what's true about God, and, he, and, and it's contrasting that with what's happening that he's struggling with. He knows that God is ultimately behind all of this, and he cannot reconcile it with the promises of God. Just look at how many times he says you, starting in verse 38. He says, but you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath and against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servants. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all the walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruin. And all who pass by pl uh, plunder him, he has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword. Lord, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the, uh, his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. Selah. It was just a few verses ago that we're talking about, God, you're going to make his kingdom reign forever. And now he's saying, God, you've defiled that very crown. And this is a hard part about being on the dark side of God's will. You know that God is faithful. You know that he keeps his promises. You know that he's always good. But there are times when these twin realities of God's promises and life's pain do not line up well. 
by how we understand. It feels as if God has rejected his people. It feels like God has maybe rejected you and in violating his steadfast love. And these are strong words here. Cast off, reject, full of wrath, renounce the covenant, and defile the crown. And we are left with a situation that is difficult to stomach. Because on one hand, God is majestic and steadfast in his love. Wouldn't you agree with that, church? He is. But there are moments when we experience the very difficult tension uh, of, God, I know your promises, but I just don't see how they line up with what's happening. Have you ever experienced that? Because I know I have. Well, look at what the psalmist does in verse 46. He goes back, and he goes back to all he's got. Circumstances might not change. The dynamics that are involved might not ever be undone because you can't undo the past. You can't. No matter how hard you try, the past is the past. So what does he do? How do you learn to live through the dark side of God's will? And this is what we should do as well. We need to remember. Please remember God's promises. You go back to God and you go back to his promises. You return to them and you rehearse them and you plead with God. Remember, O Lord, your promises. And your appeal is not to remind God of his promises. Obviously, he knows them. But rather, it's to remind you of his promises. Because at this moment, you're not believing them. Notice how prevalent is the crying out to the Lord and how it's connected with his appeal to remember. Verse 36, he says, How long, O Lord? I've said that. And I'm sure you've said that as well. And we say that many, many times when we're on the edge of really unbelief. We say, how long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol, which is hell? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which is your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked and how I bear in my heart the insults of many nations with uh, with which your enemies mock, O Lord, uh, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Don't you hear the pain? The appeal here from the psalmist is based upon his understanding of who God is. I don't see how you're upholding your promises, but I know you are. And he's telling himself that. He anchors himself not to the change of circumstance. He anchors himself to the only thing that you can have in the midst of the dark side of God will moments. You anchor yourself to the very character of God because God is immutable. God does not change. He appeals to his compassion in 47, his historical acts in 48, his sense of justice in 50, his uh, his previous promises in 51. So his hope, and your hope, church, is in the midst of the dark side moments of your life, is not why or when, it's who. Who is God? Remind yourself of that. And then notice where he ends. This is just incredible. After all we have heard in the psalm, after the roller coaster of emotions and the hard circumstances that are so disappointing, now we hear the most beautiful cry in the midst of the pitch darkness and cold uncertainty that comes with the dark side of God's will. The psalmist says, Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you know what he's doing? He's choosing to bless in the midst of hardship and difficulty on one hand and the promises of God that he can't reconcile. He lives in this world where the two things don't always mesh. And in the midst of that, he still chooses to say, blessed be the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Do you know how much faith it takes to say that? It takes so much faith. It's the very echo of Job 121 where Job says, The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This was my cry as I watched my father take his last breath. I said, The Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be his name. 
That's our prayer. This is our hope. And that's the hope of Psalm 89, that in the midst of great confusion and wrestling with God's will, you can still choose to bless God, which brings you back from the brink of unbelief. It is saying, I'm going to bless you even on the hardest day of my life. I choose to worship you. So what do we do with all of this? What lessons can we learn to live in the dark side moments? Well, the first one, and maybe the most obvious one, is don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your emotions. Just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. Lord, I feel like you've forsaken me, but I know you haven't truly forsaken me. Lord, I feel like you've turned your back on me, but I know you haven't turned your back on me. Don't trust your emotions. I wish I could get that into my soul more often than I do. Some of the dumbest things I've ever said or done in my life have come out of me believing that how I feel is gospel truth. And I'm sure the same is for you. And that's not right. Just because I feel something doesn't make it true. There are moments in your life when you will ask, God, what are you doing? Where are you right now? It feels like you're so far off. It feels like you've turned your back on me. And these questions, when they're asked in honest pain, hear that, asked in honest pain, not in sinful anger, not in sinful anger, in honest pain, but honest questions like these are normal, and they are a part of the content of the Bible for a reason. Contrary to what you may have been told, but becoming a Christian doesn't mean life is full of roses. But look at what the psalm, look at the psalms. It's a life of faith, but it's full of sorrow at times. When hard things happen at times, it's difficult to reconcile why they're happening with the promises of God. And that produces godly lament, which is a lost art in our church. Not just our church, but the church in general. Being spiritual doesn't mean you never struggle or feel abandoned. Rather, it means in the midst of the struggle, you see the need to clearly distinguish between what you feel and what you deeply know to be true biblically. And the Bible will trump your emotions. That's why we have this. Don't put this under your seat and neglect it. This is the word of God. If you're ever saying, hey, I wish God would speak to me, read your Bible. And he is. And if you say, I want him to speak audibly, read it out loud. Thank you. There's my TED Talk for you today. Don't trust your feelings at times. Uh, 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 rather, use them as diagnostic tools to uncover the lies that you're believing about God. Okay, I feel like I'm forsaken, but I know I'm not. So why am I believing that lie? And work through that. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be a roller coaster but it will identify the root issue that's going on in your heart. Secondly, cling to God's promises. The essence of what this means to mean to be a Christian is that you believe God's promises. You became a follower of Jesus Christ by believing what God's word says about you, about your sin, and your need for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Faith is not just something you do at conversion. Hey, I'm saved. It's all I need. Now I'm just going to sit in the pew. Faith is something that you do every day of your life, especially when you're on the dark side of God's will. Preach the promises of God to your soul until they are sweeter than honey to your lips. You sing them. You pray them. You cherish them. You rehearse them. And you keep doing that until your night breaks and dawn is on the horizon. Preach them to yourself. Thirdly, ask God for help. By doing this, I don't just mean help God, ask God to help deal with your circumstances. I think far too often we as Christians just go, God, remove the hardships, rather than stopping and going, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? What are you trying to refine in me from this to make me a faithful witness to you? So you pray that God would help you, not just to help you in your situation, but to help you keep believing to keep clinging to his promises. It's the prayer of Psalm 86, 11 that says, unite my heart to the fear of your name. It is pleading with God for heaven-sent perseverance. It's a commitment to keep trusting the one who keeps you trusting. Amen? And fourthly, we choose to bless. Living through the dark side experience requires a choice. A daily faith, breathe, promise, believing decision. It is the choice to bless the Lord even when things are hard. 
Job's wife crumbled under this. She said to Job, just curse God and die. And what did Job say? He said, shall we receive from God good and not receive evil? That's Job 2.10. His question is really important. Because what it's asking is, are we just in this God thing for the benefits? Are we just a Christian for what we can get? I just want to tell you right now, and this might be hard to swallow, if you've come to Christ for anything but Jesus, you got another thing coming on the day of judgment. Because you will likely hear the words, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Because we do not come and serve Christ for how he can bless us, for how he, what he can give to us. We serve Christ because he deserves it. And is there blessings involved in that? Amen. But when they seem to dry up, does your faith dry up too? God forbid. God forbid. Job, what he did was made his pain a platform for worship. And what, that's what you can do today as well. The pain you are experiencing, the pain you will experience, you can choose to use it as a platform to worship God, to choose to bless the Lord, even when things are hard, even when you don't feel like doing it. And lastly, consider Jesus. As the New Testament believers, we know the final story of Psalm 89. God did keep his promise to David. There is and forever will be a descendant of David who reigns as king, and that is Jesus Christ. He is ruling and reigning right now forever. But the path to his reign was not that we would have expected, nor was it something that has always made sense. What more is Jesus endured the dark side of God's will and accomplished the plan for redemption and lives as a constant reminder that God always keeps his promises, church. Thus, Hebrews 12 says, Consider him so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. When you see the dark side of God's will this way, it will change everything. It does something beautiful, something only God could do. It makes the dark side moments the greatest and most intimate times with God that you will ever have. I remember reading as I close a story of, uh, I forget where it was, but they were captured. Christian missionaries were captured by Muslim extremists. And they, uh, they were all locked away, minimal food, minimal resources. And they were all arguing over the course of time who was going to be the one to die first. No, if they want to execute someone, I'll go. No, 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 I'll go. They're actually arguing who's going to die. The UN eventually rescued them. And when they would run into each other, maybe like a couple months later to a year, this is what they would recount. Don't you ever miss that time? What? I felt so close to God. I have never felt that intimate to God. These are their words. This is what suffering does to us. This is what the dark side of God's will does to us. It actually draws us closer to God, not further away. But we have to choose to go that way, amen? So you'll discover that while in, in the rea when it's really dark, God is still there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, and I praise you. God, that... Uh, as we go through these hardships in our life, as we ask these tough questions, that that's the truth right there, Lord, that you are there and that these hardships are designed to cast us closer to you and not further away. Father, I pray that not only would we be good at preaching the gospel to ourselves, but we would be better in our fellowship of the saints together and preach the gospel to each other when we know that we are suffering and hurting that we wouldn't be scared of hard questions, that we wouldn't be scared of pain and hurt, but Lord, together, collectively, as your church here in Fellowship Baptist Church, Lord, that we would grow in communing with one another, holding each other close to the Lord, picking each other up when we don't have the strength to stand. Father, give us the ability to do that. In the name of Jesus, amen.